Myself, Dr. Jibran Ahmad presents to you Simply Pathology and today we are back with a very important lecture. Today we are going to read about chapter 1 of Robbins that is cell as a unit of health and disease. So today we are going to read about the updated version of this chapter and we are revising this chapter once again. So those of you who are new to my channel, welcome to my channel and welcome to Simply Pathology. So we are going to start reading about pathology. So first of all, what is pathology? If you see the term pathology is derived from the words pathos and logos. So the term pathos means suffering, whereas the term logos means study. So ultimately the term pathology means the study of suffering, okay, or the study of a disease, okay. So very importantly, before we understand anything about pathology, we need to understand one very important aspect. We need to understand the cell you know, as at the molecular level. So we have to understand, you know, the cell at a molecular level and we need to understand the working of the cell as a molecular level. Why? Because most of the pathogenesis is now based at the molecular level. So before we understand the pathology in detail, we have to understand the cell completely. So human genome, okay, our entire human genome is made up of approximately 3.2 billion DNA base pair. Okay. Now, if we divide uh, the entire genome, approximately 1.5% of the entire genome is coding certain proteins. So, they are called as the protein encoding region, whereas 98.5% do not encode any protein. So, they are called as non-protein encoding region. Out of this 98.5% of the non-protein encoding region, 80% is involved in regulation of this protein encoding region. So, only 1.5% of the genome is protein coding and around 98.5% of uh, the genome is non-protein encoding and very surprisingly 80% of this non-coding region is actually regulating this 1.5% protein encoding region. So, let us begin with the non-coding DNAs, okay. So, there are five major classes, okay. There are five major classes of non-coding DNA. They are the promoter and enhancer region, binding sites, non-coding regulatory RNAs, mobile genetic elements also called as jumping genes or transposons and special structural regions of the DNA. So let us try and understand these five major classes of non-coding RNA. So the promoter and the enhancer region, they basically provide binding site for the transcription factor. Whereas the binding sites for the factors that organize and maintain higher order, okay, uh, these are called as the chromatin structures, okay. So there are certain binding sites for factors that is going to organize and maintain higher order. So these are the chromatin structures. Then we are having the non-coding regulatory RNAs. Now 60% of the genome, okay, they are encoding certain RNAs which are not at all translated, okay. So, these RNAs usually regulate the gene expression and very important examples are micro RNAs and long non-coding RNAs which we are going to discuss in detail in today's topic of discussion, okay. Then we are having the mobile genetic elements that is the transposons which is, which is actually you know comprising more than one third of the human genome. They are also known as the jumping genes. Why? Because they move around okay they move around the genome during the evolution and they are supposed to have a role in gene regulation and then uh, the the last one is the special structural regions of the dna so there are certain special structural regions of the dna so if you see this is a chromosome okay the ends of the chromosome if you see this is the end of the chromosome these are called as the telomeres okay whereas the central area of the uh, the central area of the chromosome is called as the centromere, okay. So, these are certain special regions which are again non-coding parts. So, the telomeres, if you see, these are the chromosomal end and then we are having the centromeres which are also called as chromosomal theters, okay. They contain certain satellite DNAs which contain certain repeating sequences. So, the centromeres, okay, remember, they contain satellite DNA which is having certain repeat sequences. Now, there are two important functions of the centromere and this region. First of all, they are important for, you know, they, they provide spindle apparatus attachment, okay, during mitotic cell division for the separation of the DNA content and they also maintain the heterochromatin. So, these are the two important functions of the satellite DNA present in the centromeres. Okay. So, I hope this is very clear. These five important non-coding DNA 
promoter enhancer binding site for factors maintaining higher order the chromatin structures non coding regulatory rnas micro rna and long non coding rnas mobile genetic elements called as the jumping genes or transposons and special structural regions containing the telomeres and the centromeres now what is the importance of the telomere what is the importance of the centromere we will discuss in detail later on okay. now now we are reading about the non protein coding uh, coding regions only so there are certain things that is known as genetic variations okay we are under the non protein coding region only so we have to understand what is genetic variation or polymorphism now they may play a very important role in disease causation now any two human being any two human they are 99.5% dna identical so the you know me individuals like me and you if you see we are 99.5% dna identical and 99% we are identical with chimpanzee so a lot of dnas are similar in two human beings so only 0.5% is variation is there between two human beings so individual human variation is only approximately 0.5% which is basically accounting for 15 million base pairs only so only this much of variation is producing so much phenotypic diversity between individuals now two very common form of dna variation that exist between individuals are snps that is single nucleotide polymorphism and cnvs which is called as copy number variation okay so try to understand we are reading about genetic variations or polymorphism in the non protein coding region okay out of them 99.5% of two individuals are genetically similar so the individual differences or variation is lying in 0.5% now you must be thinking that sir why are we reading about them because this single nucleotide polymorphism and copy number variations they can explain a lot of disease causation that occurs in individual how let us try and understand so the first thing that we are going to understand is the single nucleotide pleomorphism as is clear from the definition itself uh, these are nothing but variants at single nucleotide positions and they are almost always bi allelic in nature so what do we need uh, mean over here that over here okay in between two individuals the variation is existing only at the level of a single nucleotide let me show you with the help of a diagram so for example this is a particular region of the dna so for example individual 1 okay everything is same just variation is there at a single nucleotide base pair so over here there is a similarly other versions uh, you know other individuals might contain c some of them might differ in g some of them might uh, differ at t so at this position they are you know varying with respect to a single nucleotide and this is called as single nucleotide polymorphism so i hope you have understood this okay so approximately 6 million single nucleotide Poly, uh, you know single nucleotide polymorphisms have been identified yet it occurs across the entire genome so you might find such snps in the exons introns etc in other regions one percent of the single nucleotide polymorphism can also occur in the coding region of the dna snps in the non-coding region they may affect the gene regulatory elements okay thus altering the gene expression hence influencing the disease susceptibility so try and understand this thing so snp so as we know that you know that majority of the genome is non-coding and these non-coding region are basically regulatory in nature now for example if there is any variation or single nucleotide polymorphisms is present in the non-coding region in the area where regulatory elements are there then it might alter the gene expression how for example there is a regulatory area in the dna that is controlling you know expression of one particular enzyme for example okay now because of a single nucleotide polymorphism in this regulatory area what happened that because of some snps uh, that particular uh, gene which is encoding an enzyme is now silenced okay because of the regulation by this area by the non-coding area so as a result that enzyme is not expressed and the person will have the disease so this is how snps can play a role in disease susceptibility now few neutral variants of snps also known as neutral snps may be useful markers if they happen to be co-inherited with a disease associated polymorphism as a result of physical proximity 
so there are certain snps which are quite neutral okay they are not in any regulatory area okay so these are neutral snps but they might be useful markers of a particular disease why because they might be co-inherited with a disease associated variation as a result of very physical proximity so for example if this is a particular gene dna okay now for example an snp is existing over here which is in very close proximity to a particular polymorphism that is existing okay and this polymorphism may be associated with a disease so what happens that whenever this polymorphic gene is present or polymorphic area is there nearby an snp is also present so if so so if we can detect this particular snp then we can also you know gauge the disease susceptibility of a particular individual to a disease so this is all about the single nucleotide polymorphism now we are going to read about another kind of variation which is seen in a non protein encoding region that is called as copy number variation now these are genetic variations which are consisting of different number of large contiguous stretches of dna okay uh, approximately uh, you know ranging between 1000 base pairs to million base pairs so there are variations over here now for example in snp the variation was there at the level of a single nucleotide but over here the variation is stretching over long stretches of dna approximately in the range of 1000 base pair to million base pair so again over here they are again bi allelic and they might be simply duplicated or alternatively they might be deleted in some individuals or there might be some complex rearrangements also but suffice is to say that over here there is a lot of variation involving a, 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 you know an entire stretch of dna now 50 percent of the copy number variation involves gene coding sequences like we had read that one percent of the single nucleotide polymorphism can involve the coding region but over here 50 percent of the of the copy number variations involve gene coding sequence okay and this is responsible for human phenotypic diversity now around 5 million to 24 million base pair sequence differences are there between any two individuals so if you see between any two individuals so many base pairs are different okay so let me show you copy number variation so copy number variation can either occur in the form of deletion so for example if you see this particular gene so a lot of content over here has been deleted okay or there might be duplication so one content over here so if you see this gene is deleted over here so this is one type of copy number variation okay similarly over here if you see uh, this entire sector has been duplicated over here so there's a duplication also so copy number variation can either be in the form of simple deletion or simple duplication as we are seeing but over here the basic difference is that that not just a single nucleotide but a entire length of a dna ranging between 1000 to 1 million base pair is being involved over here so these are the two very important variations that we have seen this is the single nucleotide polymorphism and we have seen the copy number variation okay okay now we are going to start another topic now before we start another topic we need to understand something that what is the importance of these DNA variation that is the SNPs and the copy number variation what is the importance see a lot of individuals they have many different type of phenotypic diversity for example I am having a black hair another individual is having a brown hair or for example I am having one kind of a disease why I am having a disease and another person is not having a disease okay so when we were sequencing the the genome of all the individuals then we had seen that there are certain variations so for example if i am having the disease and you are not having the disease so i will have some kind of snp or i will have some kind of copy number variation okay so what is happening that these are able to you know uh, you know by studying the copy number variations and the 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 single nucleotide pleomorphisms or the dna variations at large we are able to account for some kinds of diseases or some kinds of difference in the phenotypes of two individuals but these are not able to explain all the diversity of the phenotypes in the human population so dna variations they can explain some of the variations among the human population variations and how they look like or variations in the disease susceptibility of the individuals okay so this can be explained by dna variation but not all the phenotypic difference not all the difference in the diseases that is there among the different individuals okay so here comes the role of epigenetics okay so after dna variation there is a role of epigenetics so what is epigenetics it is heritable it is defined as a heritable change in the gene expression that are not caused by variations in the dna sequence this is what is called as epigenetics now we are going to see about the histone organization 
Now, first we have to understand that what is a histone. So, to understand that, let us look at this particular diagram. Okay. So, over here what we are seeing that this is a normal cell as we can appreciate over here and the cell is having a nucleus. Entire nucleus, if you see, they are made up of the chromosomes, okay. And if we take an individual chromosome over here, they are having two arms, okay. One is the short arm, okay. This is the short arm, P arm, petit. And this is the long arm called as Q. Why called as Q? Because is after P. That is why it is called as Q. Now, one other important thing, as we have already seen, the chromosome is having, what is this? This is the centromere and this is the chromosomal end, that is the telomere, which we have already seen. Now, if you see, if you see in the chromosome, there are certain areas which are light. If you see, these are light areas. Then there are certain areas which are dark. These are the dark areas. So, there are dark areas, light areas, dark areas, light areas. So, what is it? We are going to understand right now. Now, if you try to unwind, okay, if you unwind the chromosome, if you unwind the DNA, you are going to see that there is a classical arrangement over here. So, what do you see? You see something called as a nucleosome, okay. What is this? This is a nucleosome that we are appreciating over here. So, what is a nucleosome? A nucleosome, it is nothing but it is comprising of histones. So, these blue things that you are looking at, these are the histones, okay. We call it as the histones. And each histone, it is wound around by a DNA. Each histone is wound around by a DNA. Each histone is wrapped around or wound around by a DNA, okay. So, this is what is a nucleosome. So, what is a nucleosome? Let us try and understand first, okay. A nucleosome is nothing but these are DNA segments approximately 147 base pair long which is wrapped around a central core protein which is called as a histone. So, histone is nothing but it is a protein. Okay, it is a protein and what is a nucleosome? Nucleosome is histone plus the DNA which is wrapped around it. Okay, so let me show you this particular diagram so that you can understand. So, this is the core protein that is the histone. Okay, this black core protein that you are seeing, this is the histone core protein as you can appreciate, okay. This is the histone core protein, okay. And around the histone core protein, we are having the DNA, okay. So, nucleosome is nothing but the histone core protein along with the wrapped DNA. This is called as the nucleosome, okay. Now, remember this histone core protein, it is an octamer. So, there are eight units forming the core protein. H2A, H2B, H3 and H4 multiplied by 2. So, there are two such units. So, 2 H2A, 2 H2B, 2 H3, 2 H4. Okay. And they are forming a histone core protein that is the octamer. So, the histone core protein along with the DNA is forming what is called as the nucleosome. Okay. Remember and this DNA that we see it is 147 base pair long. Okay. And it is wrapping around the histone core protein. Multiple such histone core structure proteins or multiple such nucleosomes are linked with each other with the help of a linker histone which is called as the H1 linker histone, okay. And this H1 linker histone is attached with the nucleosome by means of the linker DNA, okay. This is the linker DNA along with the linker histone is attaching two nucleosomes as we can appreciate in this particular diagram, okay. Now, coming over here, as we are opening the nucleosome, what we see that there are certain areas of the chromosome, okay, wherein the nucleosome are very close to each other. So, these areas are quite dense and they are inactive areas called as the heterochromatin and they are corresponding over here to the darker areas. As we had seen, there are light and dark areas. So, the dark areas are the inactive areas which are comprising of very closely wound condensed chromatin and hence they are called as heterochromatin and they are inactive chromatin, okay. Whereas, there are certain areas if you see, if you see that there are certain areas over here, if you see, let me show you, there are certain areas which are lighter, okay. There are certain areas which are lighter. These are nothing but they are corresponding to the open up chromatin that is called as the eochromatin. What are these? These are the nucleosomes comprising the histones wound around by the DNA. And in between, there is the linker DNA and the linker histone protein which is connecting. Over here also the same thing. The only difference is that the heterochromatin, they are condensed and closed and the eochromatin, they are open and they are active. 
so suppose when we are wounding when we are unwinding the dna from the histone so we are getting this dna and once we are getting this dna once this dna is open in the eochromatin the transcription is active okay these are active sites or active areas so this dna now is going to undergo transcription to form what is known as pre mrna okay now if you look over here after transcription they are getting a pre precursor mrna which is comprising both the exons as well as the introns and after splicing okay after splicing we are getting the mature mrna having the five prime utr and three prime utr area and then there is an open reading frame which is going to undergo translation and give rise to a particular protein so all this thing we need to understand the intricacies so that you understand that what is the meaning of a histone what is the meaning of you know dna what is a nucleosome what are linker histone what is a linker dna okay what is the nucleus what is the chromosome okay then we are seeing the arrangement when it is called as heterochromatin when it is called as eochromatin why the chromosome is having alternate lighter and darker band lighter areas are the areas corresponding to eochromatin wherein the chromatin is open okay and dna is completely unwound and then it is ready for transcription and translation giving rise to the protein so as we have already seen the heterochromatin is the dense inactive chromatin whereas the eochromatin is the open active chromatin okay i hope this point is crystal clear to everyone okay now as i have already explained in the nucleosome we are having a central core histone protein which is nothing but forming an octamer comprising of h2a h2b h3 and h4 into 2 so there are completely eight units so it is an octamer now the linker dna is comprising of 20 to 80 nucleotide whereas the linker histone is the h1 as i have already mentioned nucleosome is nothing but it is the histones along with the dna now remember the histones are positively charged whereas the dna they are negatively charged that is facilitating the wrapping up of the dna around the histone okay now remember dna unwinding and access to the transcription factor is regulated by histone modification okay now remember one thing now this dna now what i am trying to say that the dna unwinding that how this dna is unwinding and how the transcription is getting activated it is regulated by certain factors what is this it is regulated by histone modification for example acetylation methylation these are all histone modification and this histone modification is carried out by certain marks so certain areas of the histones they are marked marked in the form of acetylation marked in the form of methylation so there are certain marks so the histone can be these marks can be dynamically written and they can be erased so what are marks marks are nothing but these are certain modification which can be written which can be marked on a particular histone as well as they can be erased from a particular histone so marks for example if you are looking what are marks for example histone acetylation is taking up now this modification this acetylation is one type of histone modification and this mark that is this acetylation is opening up the chromatin and we know that when the chromatin is open they will form eochromatin then there will be dna transcription translation protein formation so they are going to stimulate transcription and therefore gene expression will be there similarly there are certain marks for example that is going to cause for example methylation this is again one type of histone modification but this modification is going to condense the chromatin and therefore they will form heterochromatin that is going to inhibit any kind of transcription so i hope you can understand this particular situation that what we are talking about we are talking about histone modification okay so the dna winding or unwinding the dna condensation or opening up of the dna it depends completely on certain histone modification like acetylation methylation and these are also called as marks now remember these marks are reversible they can be written and they can be erased as well so above modification that we have seen they may involve the dna directly now right now we are talking about histone acetylation histone methylation so via the histones the dna expression is being altered but sometimes the modification can directly involve the dna so this is called as for example dna acetylation dna methylation so they will give rise directly to you know, they can regulate the dna expression or dna you know condensation okay now dna of a single human cell is approximately 1.8 meters long 
Now the above histone modifications that we have seen that is the histone marks. So whatever histone modification that is happening that is acetylation or methylation, they are brought about by chromatin writer complex. The histone marks if you see they are reversible as I told you the marks they can be written as well as they can be erased. Okay. So this happens through the activity of chromatin erasers. So as there are chromatin writer complex which is causing histone modification, so there are chromatin erasers which can you know erase whatever marks are there. Now chromatin remodeling complex can reposition the nucleosomes on a DNA thus exposing or obscuring a gene regulatory element such as promoters. Okay. Now, what is epigenetics? As we have already seen and we have read the definition of epigenetics, remember as we had seen that DNA variations alone, they cannot account for all the, the, the diversity among the different individuals. Then comes the role of epigenetics. What is epigenetics? Epigenetic changes, these are heritable changes in the gene expression that are not caused by variations in the DNA sequence. And epigenetics means above genetics, okay? It is above genetics, okay? It is above the understanding of genetics. So the term epigenetics literally means above genetics, okay? These means above genetics and these are heritable changes, okay? The epigenetic alterations or epigenetic dysregulation are implicated in cancer. Now, these changes, they are reversible. So, the important thing is that they are amenable to therapeutic intervention. So, we can subject them to treatment. And these are nothing but whatever histone modification that we are reading now that we just saw. Histone acetylation, methylation, okay. So, all these changes which are taking place, which is altering the gene expression, Okay, this is nothing but this is the epigenetics. So, let us see the different types of histone modification. So, the first important histone modification if you see is the histone methylation. So, for example, the histones are having many kinds of lysine and arginine residues. Okay, now these can become methylated. So, methylation of the lysine residue can lead to both transcriptional activation as well as repression. But know this that always the methylation component in most cases it leads to transcriptional repression. It is going to cause gene silencing. Now for example, if there is a silencing of the tumor suppressor gene, so what is going to happen? Cancer is going to take place. So neoplasia is going to occur when the tumor suppressor genes by mistake they are silent. So over here there is no genetic mutation that is taking place. But such epigenetic alterations can have implication in cancer. For example, if there is a methylation of the tumor suppressor gene, for example, TP53. So there will be loss of activity of tumor suppressor gene that can play an important role in carcinogenesis. Similarly, there is a histone acetylation. Okay, this is another kind of modification involving the lysine residue. So, for example, in presence of the enzyme acetyl transferases, okay, the lysine residues are acetylated. So, over here, this kind of modification can lead to opening up of the chromatin. So, there will be eochromatin that is going to stimulate transcription and therefore formation of proteins. Similarly, there are certain deacetylases also that can again deacetylate the lysine residues leading to chromatin condensation. So, suffice is to say that normally the histone acetylation, it stimulates, you know, gene transcription, okay, and therefore growth and uh, uh, proliferation. And it is also a reversible change. So, suffice is to say that the epigenetic alterations are reversible in nature. Histone phosphorylation, they are involving the serine residues and they might either stimulate or they might inhibit transcription. Then we are having DNA methylation at the gene Regulatory elements, example at the areas of the promoters, this can again lead to transcriptional silencing and then we are having chromatin organizing factors. So, with this we have completed the histone modification in details as well. Coming to the last leg of today's lecture, we are going to end by reading about the non-coding RNAs which are regulating gene expression. So, in the beginning if you remember, I have discussed the five classes of non-coding uh, you know, genes. And over here, we are going to read about the non-coding RNAs which are regulating gene expression, mainly the microRNAs, which are nothing but a small RNA molecules and long non-coding RNAs, which are more than 200 nucleotides in length. These are transcribed, but they are not translated. So the concept of microRNAs, first we are going to understand, this is a very important long answer question, which is asked in the exam. MicroRNAs, they do not encode any protein. They just modulate the translation of target mRNAs. 
so it is going to just modulate or it is going to you know alter the expression of a target mrna how we are going to see it is responsible for post transcriptional silencing of gene expression by microrna it is a fundamental and well conserved mechanism of gene regulation so post transcriptional so after already a gene has been transcribed and an mrna has been formed okay after an mrna has been formed that mrna can be targeted by microrna and it can be silenced that is why we are using the term post transcriptional silencing of gene expression now these are critical regulators of developmental pathways and pathological conditions like cancer so they have very important role in the developmental pathways in our body as well as they are having an important role in cancer the human genome encodes approximately 6000 micro rna genes 30% which is comprising 30% of the protein coding genes okay now individual micro rna can regulate multiple protein coding genes thus it can regulate gene expression so in short what is happening that the micro rna genes they are transcribed into primary transcript primary micro rna transcript which is undergoing some kind of trimming and further processing with the help of dicer enzyme to form smaller segments this smaller segment or single stranded micro rna that is formed will associate with an rna induced silencing complex okay and this single stranded mi uh, micro rna is approximately 21 to 30 nucleotides in length now and this risc stands for rna induced silencing complex so this micro rna now it is ready to function what it will do with the help of this risk complex they will go and bind to a target mrna and it will cause mrna cleavage or it is going to reduce the translation of that mrna the net result is there is no protein formation this is called as post transcriptional silencing which is the major role of micro rnas similarly we are also having short interfering rnas okay these are actually synthetic forms of micro rna micro rna we are having inside the body usually this short interfering rnas they are found outside the body exogenous these are short rna sequences they also interact with the dicer and the risk complex and they function very similar to the endogenous micro rna okay synthetic short interfering rna sequencing they are potential therapeutic agents which are used to silence the pathogenic genes so these are usually functioning outside the body short interfering rnas and they are very very important now this is what we were speaking about so if you can see this is a particular cell okay and this cell is having a target gene which is giving rise to a target mrna and over here what is happening that there is synthesis of a micro rna okay from the micro rna gene so the micro rna gene is undergoing transcription giving rise to the primary micro rna then it is forming the precursor micro rna this precursor micro rna is coming out of the nucleus and over here with the help of the dicer enzyme it is undergoing further trimming and processing to form single stranded micro rna 21 to 30 nucleotide in length now this micro rna is combining with the risk complex that is the rna induced silencing complex okay this is the risk complex that we have already seen over here okay this rna induced silencing complex that we have already seen now whatever target mrna that has already been transcribed okay they will be acted upon by this complex of micro rna and risk complex leading to either mrna cleavage or translational repression in both cases there is ultimately gene silencing and there is no protein formation so ultimately gene expression has been silenced or altered okay so this is all about the micro rna now similarly there is another non protein coding region that is the long non coding rna which is again modulating gene expression just like the micro rna so how they are regulating so long non coding rnas can combine with an area of the chromatin and then they can restrict an rna polymerase okay so in this uh, in, so this is one way for example x chromosome is transcribing a particular long non coding rna that is called as zist and this this itself is causing physiological x chromosome inactivation leading to gene silencing now there are certain enhancers okay so sometimes enhancers can serve as a site for attachment of a long non coding rna okay 
so enhancers can actually you know they you know they, they can form sites for synthesis of long non coding um, you know rnas which when expand can actually stimulate the process of transcription via stimulation of gene promoters so they can either silence a particular gene or they can promote transcription of a particular gene now the functions of the long non coding rnas if you see they can promote transcription factor binding in that case they might either activate the gene or they itself can bind and trap a transcription factor so they will not allow the transcription factor to bind to a particular gene in this case they are going to you know trap the the transcription factor so leading to gene silencing similarly long non coding rnas they may facilitate histone or dna modification as well and they may also help stabilize certain protein complexes which has a role in gene expression so with this we have completed the part 1 of this chapter number 1 thank you very much for watching this particular video